Um, so my name is Tamika Sims, and And I am the Director for Food Technology Communications at the International Food Information Council Foundation in Washington, DC. Um, so before I jump into my presentation, let me just talk a little bit about IFIC Foundation, who we are and what we do. So this is our logo for the foundation. Um, so we're a nonprofit science communication organization and we develop communication resources that are directed towards consumers. Um, part of our communication strategy includes strategic engagement with food production and nutrition government agencies such as FDA, USDA, EPA, and so on. Um, we also um, pride ourselves on having a trusted engagement with influencers. So that includes journalists, um, RDs, other types of physicians, um, at farmers and so on. So people who are in touch with the food system, but are also in touch with consumers on a regular basis. We follow consumer trends and insights, and I will actually show you some data from our most recent 2019 Food and Health Survey today to show you some um, consumer perceptions about food production um, and uh, food labels as well. We also do issues management and rapid response. And so when reports come out about food production or nutrition, our team made up of RDs and PhDs will talk about um, how to dissect the science in a way that consumers are able to understand. If it's a good report, we'll rally uh, uh, behind that report. Um, but if it's not such a good report, we're able to dispel myths and misinformation about um, uh, science um, that may be found within, or lack thereof, I should say. So for me specifically, this one, this one. Can everybody, can everybody hear me? Oh, is that better? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so specifically for me, I uh, work in the on the food production team and are in charge of these issues. So sustainability, animal welfare, food safety, pesticides, and biotechnology. Um, the other arm of IFIC is focused on nutrition. So they focus on um, nutrients and eating patterns, and eating patterns across the lifespan and also sweeteners. So we're divided in a way between talking about nutrition and then also talking about how food is produced. So basically everything that we're doing on a daily basis is trying to connect consumers to how food is produced but then also trying to connect food producers to the consumer. And that can be a tough task, depending on how you look at the best way to strategize to do so. Um, certainly um, from an industry perspective, knowing what's on the consumer's mind and how to engage with them is something that we're always trying to do. Well, we think that there are three key steps in connecting point A to point E. So listening is the first one, asking, and then sharing. So imagine yourself going to a party you've been invited to and you don't know anyone in the room, but you want to maybe be invited to the next party. So if you were to go into this group of people, the first thing you might do is just to listen to see what everybody is talking about. Then you might ask a few questions and then you would proceed to share your own experiences, your name and so on and begin a conversation with these folks. So first, listening. So I'm gonna take you through a listening exercise that I had our comms department pull together um, based off of some social media listening that we did on two uh, interesting issues. So basically I asked for a social listening to be done on GMOs and then also ingredients. So this includes um, both artificial and natural ingredients. And we can see there's like a low murmur of conversation happening um, about GMOs, which will be the purple, uh, purple uh, graph here. And then uh, on ingredients, which would be the peachy pinky color here. 
around February, there's a huge uptick in GMO conversations. And around that time, we saw that the final decision on bioengineer food labeling had occurred. There's a few things that occurred, occurred after that as well in between February and April. Um, Aqua Advantage Salmon, that was a big thing that was created quite a bit of conversation in social media. Um, for ingredients, interestingly, there was uh, a pledge made by, I think, PetSmart or some pet food company um, that they were gonna, only going to produce um, pet food with natural ingredients. So this created quite a bit of uproar as far as in the social hemisphere and talking about ingredients. So here's the media breakdown for GMOs. Primarily, you can see that most of the conversations that were happening around GMOs around this time um, were, was on Twitter. So both, so Twitter cre created the most of the buzz, and then online news had a nice share, and then blogs and forums as well. For ingredients, we saw that online news and blogs were actually contributing, contributing a lot to the conversation. Twitter is there as well. You can see that blue little blue amount of uh, the graph there. But online news and blogs um, had the lion's share here. So sentiment and hashtags, we can tell if there's positive conversations happening, um, which would be the green, neutral conversations, or negative conversations, neutrals yellow and uh, negative conversations are red. Um, so for GMOs, mostly it's uh, neutral and the same thing for ingredients, but you can see for GMOs, there's a lot more negative conversations happening. Um, but for ingredients, there's a lot more positive conversations happening in comparison to the GMOs. So this is like, uh, this. everybody's seen these word bubbles. So big, the bigger the word, the more it's being used in uh, social conversations in, uh, for hashtags. Um, but also you wanna note the color. So if it's red, it's still associated with a negative conversation. If it's yellow, neutral, green, positive. So this is, a, this is the hashtag bubble for GMO conversations. So you can see the number one hashtag is GMOs. Um, people are also using the hashtag Monsanto. People are using the hashtag food. Glyphosate, bear, swerve, I'm not really sure where that came from. <laughs> Non-GMO, organic, sugar replacement. Um, for the ingredient conversations, the number one hashtag being used at that time was Heights Farm Pet Foods. Um, the Pets Biz is another big one. Early Biz, food, dog, cat, neutral. Um, so you really see here that there are no negative hashtags that were being used in these, in these conversations. So as I mentioned, the next step after listening would be asking. So listening gives you just a piece of the puzzle to see what people are talking about. Um, and you can use that in your strategy to communicate with consumers. But you also need to ask questions. You want to see what's on the consumer's mind. And so here I'm gonna jump into our 2019 Food and Health Survey. So IFIC is, this is the 14th year that IFIC has done this consumer health survey. Um, and so we get perceptions from consumers on nutrition, ingredients, food production, food safety, um, a, the full gamut of things that's associated with um, consumers and food, um, food production and what they're eating. Um, and so this is an online survey, it's nationally representative um, from the United States. So what we found in 2019 is that taste and price continue to be the top drivers as far as what uh, consumers consider when they're making a um, food and beverage purchase. Healthfulness um, is also still a top driver, um, getting very close to price as you can see in 2019. Um, convenience rose from 2018 to 2019 quite a bit. Um, we also put environmental sustainability here year after year. Um, actually, this year we changed this quite uh, just a little bit. Um, it used to just say sustainability um, up until last year. And so we uh, were concerned that 
just using the term sustainability, consumers might not know that what we're thinking of, what we're thinking of is environmental sustainability. So the use of natural resources and um, the ability to grow food for a growing population and so on. Um, so we put environmental there. And so we think that we saw this drop from 2018 to 2019 because we changed the term slightly. But you can still see that there's a good 30% of consumers um, labeled this as a top driver. So we went on to ask consumers um, what other uh, attributes are impactful for you when you're making a food and beverage purchase. Number one is taste. If you're looking at the blue and green bars combined, you can see that over 80% of consumers are voting for taste as having a great impact. Um, trust in the brands next. Price. Um, healthiness, convenience, and environmental sustainability are in, uh, in third place when you're looking at all these characteristics combined. So you can see in the context of things, things can, what's most important can change slightly for consumers. So trust in the brand and recognizing the ingredients that go into the product. And this is something we've seen from year to year. People want to um, be able to recognize the ingredients that go into the product. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir um, quite a bit, but um, it, it's interesting to see that it remains a top thing that consumers are looking for. Knowing where food comes from is important. So we saw this um, last year as well when we had this group and we asked this question last year as well. So consumers want to know where food comes from. They want to know that the manufacturer has a commitment to producing the food in an environmental sustainable way. So this complements the previous question um, or the question before that. I should say, um, and being able to access information about how the food was produced. Um, last two, knowing that the food was produced with animal welfare in mind or using modern um, farming technologies, you can see it drops down um, to just a little over 30% for the last um, option. So we also saw that consumers are looking to make environmental sustainable environmentally sustainable purchases, um, when we ask them just flat out, is it important to you when you're making a food and beverage purchase that it was produced in an environmentally sustainable way? Sustainable way. So 54% said yes. Last year, we asked consumers um, when you're making a food and beverage purchase, is it important to you that it was produced in a sustainable way? Just sustainable. And we had 59%. So we saw, again, just a slight drop um, from 2018 to 2019. Um, what's interesting to me too here is that almost 30% of consumers are saying it's not important to them or unimportant. We also saw that um, when we're asking them about uh, the, that same 54% of people, what characteristics of sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, are, are important to them. We saw that they wanted to know that the label um, is showing that the product was uh, locally grown. Um, labeled as sustainably sourced, you can see also very close to that 50% of the first option. Labeled as non-GMO or not bioengineered, again, um, well over 40%, close to 50%. Labeled as organic, um, a little over 40 Recyclable packaging, um, this is something I know that, of course, industry is uh, concerned with. Um, but you can see that these other attributes are coming ahead um, of that for a consumer. So we asked flat out um, to consumers whether or not they agree or disagree with the statement above. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? It's hard for consumers to know whether the food choices they make are environmentally sustainable. And you can see that over 60% of consumers do agree with this. So they feel that it's hard for them to know whether or not the purchase that they're making is environmentally sustainable. We asked um, whether or not they agree with this statement as well. If it was easier for you to know whether the food choices you were making were environmentally sustainable, it would have a greater influence on the choice that you would make. 
And once again, we see over 60% of consumers agree with this statement as well. So here's another question um, that we've asked for about three years now. And basically, we would give consumers a nutrition facts panel um, that would be found on two different products. So if they have the same nutrition facts panel, but there are some different attributes about the product, which would seem healthier to the consumer? Um, so if you're looking at the blue bars, that would indicate, a growth on that side would indicate that product A is healthier. If you're looking at the gray bars, that would indicate that product B is healthier. So if product A is fresh to the consumer, that seems healthier to them. Product A is all natural, that seems healthier to them. Product A has ingredients that you are familiar with. Um, and product B has ingredients that you're less familiar with. Product A is healthier. Product A is produced in a more environmentally sustainable way. It's healthier. Product A is using newer technology. Um, we thought this was a surprising. We saw this in 2018 as well. Newer technology indicates healthier to consumers, you can see. Um, and, but when you jump down to the last one, product A is a bioengineered food and product B is not bioengineered. Consumers see B as being healthier than A. So this next one, we ask consumers, what type of labels are you looking for when you're shopping for food and beverages in a store? Which all the answers are indicated, uh, responses I should say are indicated in blue bars. Shopping for food and beverages. Or eating away from home, that's all the green bars there. Um, for the past maybe four years or so, the label that consumers are looking for when shopping for food and beverages um, primarily is natural. They're looking for a natural label. No, no added hormones or steroids is close behind, along with race without antibiotics. Um, but what I think is very interesting here too is that when consumers are eating away from home at, in a restaurant or cafeteria setting, over 40% of them are not looking for any labels at all. We actually saw this number grow from last year. We were right around 40%, and you can see here, we're just about at 50. So 50% 50 of people are not looking for any labels when they're eating in a restaurant or a cafeteria or a, a, a similar setting. So we also asked consumers this question for the past several years whether or not they're confident in the safety of our, uh, our food supply system. Um, nicely, almost 70% of consumers are conf confident in the safety of our food supply system. Um, this number has grown since last year. We have seen it be over 60%, um, but it's grown. I mean, this is almost 70% for sure. That's a good thing. But we asked consumers, what are the most important food safety issues that you're concerned with? And the top three for at least the past six years have been foodborne illness from bacteria, carcinogens or cancer-causing chemicals, or chemicals in food. Um, so we've seen, like I said, these have been the top three, but the ones underneath have been creeping along uh, quite high um, and getting close to these top three guys. So pesticides, food additives and ingredients, animal antibiotics, GMOs, and the presence of allergens. Um, and this next graph is showing the results of a question we posed to consumers. And we said to them, imagine if you um, had heard about a notice at about a food safety recall um, that's caused by a bacterial contaminant. Where would you get that information um, about said recalls? Where, what do you think is a trusted source? Um, and the top choice you can see clearly here is a government agency. Um, and this is a new question that we asked this year. Uh, we have asked in previous years, where do you get information about food? Um, we've seen that consumers do get information about food from a, a bevy of uh, resources. Um, but it's, in, so that's why it's interesting to see that, and I guess a good thing actually, 
that um, government agencies is a top source for recall info for consumers, followed by consumer advocacy, group, advocacy groups, healthcare professionals, or a food company. So we've done the listening, we've done the asking, and now we're gonna do the sharing. Um, and so basically I'm going to, for our sharing example, I'm just going to show you um, an example from our perspective. So IFIC Foundation has a program called Understanding Our Food, and this is something that's been underway for a number of years. Um, in 2017, we tried a new approach called Process This, um, and where we use um, crisp graphics and um, punchy titles, quick bits of information and posted them on social media, um, primarily Facebook, um, to give consumers information about ingredients and food production and nutrition and we looked to see how they will respond. Um, we had some successes in 2017, so we did it again in 2018 um, with some new graphics. Um, and we tried to push the envelope just a little bit more and talk about things that are technical and sometimes hard to talk about and look to see what kind of responses we would get on um, Facebook. So these are the three of, the t of, of our uh, graphics that we posted on Facebook. And we targeted um, people who were active um, hobbyists. And what is an active hobbyist? <laughs> an active hobbyist is someone who actually cares about food and nutrition, but may not take vitamins. Or someone who cares about exercise, but doesn't belong to a gym. So they're generally people who have uh, interests in things and food and nutrition, but they're not quite committed to any one thing. Um, and we saw that um, some of our creatives performed well and some of them did not. Um, you can see that here the images are bright and bold. Um, the first one with the bananas starts off with a question. It's basically a hook to grab the person's interest and maybe plant a seed for intrigue. Um, and, but the message is quick. And then the idea is to use this to drag the person I shouldn't say drag, to <laughs> encourage the person to then come to our website and learn more. So it's quick and easy, it's crisp, it needs to stand out in the Facebook uh, feed as well. Um, and so we put these, these guys out there. We had six creatives total. Um, so this is three of them. Would anybody guess that these were successful or not successful? No? So these were actually successful for us. Um, again, crisp images, quick messages, maybe plant a seed for intrigue. Unfortunately, we did have some creatives that did not perform well. So, and it's not about the topic, it's not because it was talking about food waste, it's not because it was talking about ingredients or labels, but you can see the difference in the two sets here is that the images are not as crisp, not one of them asks the question to plant the seed for intrigue. Um, and they just don't stand out as much. There's more text in the, in the body um, of the image as well. So that just gets lost in the Facebook feed for consumers. So the cost per click link, um, I mean, a, a dollar 18 is, excuse me, is uh, from what we've been told is, um, performing at 20% higher than the industry average. Um, but of course, uh, you, you want the cost to be as low as possible. We did actually get almost 51,000 uh, link clicks, um, over a hundred, over, I'm sorry, over a thousand page likes. So for the uh, IFIC Foundation page, that was just an added bonus. We were really trying to drive traffic to the website. Um, but we did get over 2,000 post shares, so that was a good thing as well. Um, combined, we had over six million impressions, so that was a good thing. This was something that only ran for eight weeks, so we were um, excited about that. 
And then for all the visitors that we got to the IFIC website for Process This, um, almost 100% of them were brand new. Like they had never heard of IFIC Foundation before. Um, they had, ne of course, never heard of Process This. So it was a good way to drive traffic to get new people to come and learn about food production um, and food processing and nutrition for us. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. I'd like to give everybody a chance to have some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Do you have a question? Hi. Whenever you showed the data on the sustainability aspect, did you go into any detail about like, what does sustainability mean to the consumer? Um, that's a good question. So for all the questions we set, um, there's like an educational parameters, so to speak, so that there's nothing in the body of a battery of questions where the consumer doesn't understand the terms that we're using. Um, and as I mentioned this year, um, as opposed to previous years, we were just saying sustainable, sustainable purchase. Do you want to make a sustainable purchase? And we kind of thought maybe they're not understanding what we meant. And that's why we added environmentally sustainable this year. Um, but even for that, we made sure that they understood what that meant. Um, so there's part of um, building the survey is being sure that there's a clear understanding from all the survey takers that they understand the terms that we're using. Um, but yeah, we, we wanted this year to be sure to add in environmentally sustainable because we know from our industry perspective and what sustainable means can mean a lot of things for consumers. And we've seen in previous years that what consumers think sustainable is, is all over the map. So, yeah. Yeah, very good question. Uh, any others? Just raise your hand if you have a question. Thank you. Give me one second to get over there. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing a very uh, important uh, view of how the buzz went out through the Twitter. Mm -hmm. Were you able to see how much those people were understanding the, some technical aspect of bioengineered or GMO because sometimes there's a technical limitation and what we can do or there's what we cannot do. Mm -hmm. Were you able to see that aspect on uh, Twitter? Um, we... Thank you. We could look at that. We I didn't ask the comms department to pull that out, but you can begin to comb through tweets and see where the conversation is going. Um, you know, it's a labor of love, but you can do it. Um, I mean, there are certain terms that I think that we use in industry that are not on the radars for consumers. Um, for instance, GMOs is a, you know, it's a term that's been used for a really long time. And it, unfortunately, it encompasses all bioengineered foods as far as what the consumer is thinking at this time. Um, I think I originally asked them to pull um, CRISPR and <laughs> they were like, consumers are not talking about CRISPR enough to really give you the results you want to see um, as far as you know, conversation growth. So you know, that's always something that I think we have to take into perspective um, once we're jumping into trying to be in the social media conversations is um, seeing what terms are really being used by consumer before you jump in to give them information. Even if it's very good information, if they're not talking about it, it's really just gonna go sh right over their heads, unfortunately. And, but that's not to say that I think um, that we shouldn't um, be just trying to prepare ourselves to talk about, um, to talk about CRISPR or to talk about, you know, well, any other type of new technology that's coming up. Um, but, and, and that's why I wanted to be sure to kind of show this like a stepwise um, snippet for each thing that we do. 
because it does require you to do a little bit of listening before you decide on what type of information you're going to share and what's going to be accepted um, by consumers or people in social media in general. All right, it looks like we have one more question here. I will get to you. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm from the New Food Economy. Uh, it's a digital magazine. I, I want to know uh, what, uh, what are the groups or media that you think uh, foster the greatest progress in food literacy for the public? I mean, who, who is most effective that, uh, at... Um, uh, at getting reliable information and negotiating all the uh, all all the uh, and clarifying the controversies, I, I, you're you're one of them, obviously. Yeah. But uh, you know, wh where else should one look? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that we feel as though there's no one silver bullet um, for trying to you know be this really great source for great information on food science and food production and nutrition and health and food safety. Um, but one of the things that we do and we've done in the, in, for years now is be in touch with journalists. And the, the gentleman that presented earlier before me talked about being pinged by journalists and being prepared to talk to journalists. Um, but we found being um, in touch with journalists is a good thing for sure. But one of the things that we found the most is that being in touch with journalists that are talking about popular culture and general lifestyle is one of the best uh, ways to be in touch with consumers and reach and, and be able to reach them. So we get in touch, uh, we've been in touch with con uh, groups, um, journalists from Shape Magazine and Rachel Ray and Martha Stewart and you know, men's health, very broad uh, swipe at lifestyle and um, living. You know, it's not really just focused on nutrition, but it's focused on lifestyle. Um, and I think that's where the strategy came in for process this, these active hobbyists. So you have people that have varying interests. They're generally upbeat, active people, but they are really not, they're not extremists in one way or another. So I really feel like being in touch with journalists that have a grasp on lifestyle and have a broad audience is pretty effective. This will be the how AI can help you cope with information overload. This is Jonathan Griffin. Thank you. Thank you. And good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're, we're often um, told that AI is going to revolutionize um, all aspects of our, our lives, in fact. Um, and in popular culture, you'll see, um, you often see AIs that are um, solving our information problems. So, um, for example, the, com the computer in Star Trek, um, C-3PO in Star Wars, um, Marvin, the paranoid android, which is this, this one here. Um, so they all provide, um, provide answers. And I, I'm going to um, consider in this talk um, when that future is coming to food science and technology. So I'm going to consider it when things move forward. Uh, yes. I'm going to consider it soon. <laughs> yeah. So I'm using this. Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm going to um, consider um, when 
AI um, is going to make significant differences in, in um, the area of food science and, and technology. Um, so I, I'm um, Jonathan Griffin and I work for um, uh, the International Food Information Service and we are a um, educational not-for-profit. Um, we were set up uh, 50 years ago now um, by a number of trade associations including IFT. So I'm going to start by um, considering um, information overload. Uh, so there are a number of reasons why this um, is likely to give us a headache in, in our area. So firstly, the growth um, uh, of the volume of information. Secondly, um, the, the increasing amounts of deceptive information. And thirdly, um, rely, unreliable search tools. So we publish um, a, a database called FSTA, um, and um, FSTA in, uh, aims to cover the full range of uh, food science and technology information that's published. Um, at the moment, um, we're covering about 23,000 sources. So that, that's a lot for one person to, to keep up with. Um, and you can see from the graph that the amount of information in our area is increasing um, really rapidly. So this shows um, the, the, uh, the number of records that we've published over the, um, since 1968. Um, and you can see that the amount of information has doubled in the last 10 years. And all the indications are is that that, that will continue. So that's one challenge. Um, a second challenge relates to um, the um, amount of, of poor quality um, food science technology that's, um, information that's available. Uh, you'll all be familiar with fake, fake news, obviously. Um, you probably will have seen that um, apparently bacon causes cancer, Nutella causes cancer, um, and apparently not eating enough fruit and vegetables um, is as bad for your health as divorce. And so it goes on and on. Um, another aspect of um, unreliable information is um, fake science. This is a bit more insidious, um, but the way this works is um, uh, researchers submit um, articles and pay for the, uh, those articles to be published on the understanding that those articles are going to be peer reviewed, but actually the journal publishers don't do that. Um, we receive submissions from journals for including in our database, um, and in the last couple of years we've had to ex um, uh, turn down um, 49 journals that were essentially publishing um, fake science. The third area, the third problematic area, is there is now a wealth of, of different search tools that you can use to find information on, on our subject. Um, the most popular, um, Google, uh, Google Scholar, Bing, um, for example, are the most problematic. So, so looking at um, Google Scholar, which, uh, Google, which is widely used, um, there are a number of significant flaws. Um, for those of you who use it, you're probably familiar with this first quote from, from um, one of our interviewees who said it's like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Um, and that's, that's often the case when you, you do a search, you end up with uh, uh, 100,000 results. Um, other features which are significant is that um, the re results that are returned are often irrelevant. Um, and the ranking of those results is problematic as well. Um, and that's in, in, um, as expressed in this quote from the CEO of um, a price comparison site who said, people expect Google to deliver them the most relevant search results, but the truth is that they're exploiting that trust and showing them results that people pay for. Now you would think, given that when you do a typical search, you get a million search results, that that's everything. Actually, it's not, and, and um, often, you using a search engine like Google, you will miss relevant results, and you miss them because of the algorithms and, and, and the, the data. So you may be thinking, well, so what? Does it, does it really matter? Um, it does, um, and, and we say, I say this based upon conversations that we've had with researchers and companies in our area, and they highlight um, three detrimental real-life consequences. So uh, waste, waste in terms of, of time um, and in terms of funding, um, poor quality products, um, and slower speed to market. So 
uh, to understand whether AI can help with, with um, these challenges, um, it's worth considering um, what, what it is. So the promise, um, the promise of those various robots I talked about is that in doing a, a, in asking a question, you get a single right answer rather than a list of a long list of search results. So the promise is that you ask a robot um, and they tell you answers to your business questions, your technical questions, your regulatory questions. And I don't, some of you may have seen this, this particular robot um, who's called Sophia. She, um, she it, I don't, I don't know, um, has appeared on um, various TV, um, TV shows, um, has spoke at, has spoke at conferences, um, and she, she embodies that promise of the single right answer. Um, unfortunately, um, to quote um, Facebook's head of artificial intelligence, this particular AI um, is BS. And there you see her in action, I think. Yeah. Uh, so to understand this potential, um, it, it's worth looking at how um, briefly about how AI is defined. So two general distinctions, um, uh, general AI and narrow AI. General AI is where um, the AI works out how to solve your problems and gives you that single right answer uh, and generally um, displays um, elements of human intelligence. The second type of AI, um, which is more often called machine learning, um, is limited. So it's limited to specific domains and specific tasks, such as the weather and what's the weather forecast for, for tomorrow. Um, at the moment, um, General AI, um, the, the robot future, is, is nowhere on the horizon. However, um, narrow AI um, is with us now, and there are an increasing number of applications of, of it um, in the food and technology um, area. So I'm, um, I'm going to give you some examples. And, and just to, to some of the answer to the, to the question about how, how AI can help, is that not that you get single right answers, but that in using it, you get relevant and insightful search results. And I'm now gonna give you some, some examples of, of these, these applications. Um, there are three areas in which um, narrow AI is being deployed. Um, look up search tools, visual search tools, and horizon scanning. So lookup search tools are something that you'll all be familiar with. So a search box, you enter your keywords, um, and you get a list of search results. This example um, is called Semantic Scholar, and you can see that the promise, the uh, particular promise, is to cut through the clutter, to get rid of all those irrelevant results that, that are so problematic. Another example um, is called Meta. Um, both of these services are um, based upon PubMed data, so they're they are focused in uh, nutrition and health particularly. The third example um, is uh, um, a new service called Wisdom AI, um, and um, this uh, does provide lookup search um, facilities, but, but more than that, it produces um, analytics of search results. So for example, if you're interested in emerging trends in a particular area, um, it will pr produce graphic representations of what those are. If you're interested in who um, the leading researchers are, the leading research institutes, again, it can produce visual representations of what, of what they are. So continuing on that, that visual um, theme, um, the next example um, is vis visual search tools. Uh, and um, this is a, a new and, and um, a emerging area. Um, this particular example is called, you know, and again, nutrition and health. Um, th the benefit of using this is that um, there's a difference to be made between when you're doing a search and um, you know what you're looking for, um, and when you're doing a search and you don't quite know what you're looking for and you want to explore an area. Um, so. The way this, this type of search engine works is that it produces a, a map of concepts, of related concepts, which you can explore. 
and the benefit is, is encapsulated in this quote um, from the developers, and, and that is that uh, when it comes to innovation and NPD, um, the most important connections are often those that you don't know how to look for. So that brings me to um, the third area, which um, I, I think is particularly um, of, of relevance from a, um, from a company perspective. Um, and again, a, a, a few emerging examples of how off-the-shelf AI software um, is being used to facilitate the searching of, of the web, but also proprietary databases to produce updates on science, uh, but science, but also market trends and legislation. And a, a key component to this, um, this type of service is that it needs to be customized. Um, the, the, the examples I'm aware of is that Camden BRI have a horizon scanning um, tool that's generally available. I also understand that, that um, a number of the larger food and beverage companies are also taking this approach to, to horizon scanning. Now, I've, I've said that this, this is very much um, a, an emerging area. So if it's an area that you're in, uh, tempted to um, attempt to explore further, I thought I'd give you some, some pointers as to what makes an effective um, AI service. And so, so there are three ingredients, really. So the first one is algorithms. The second one is data. And the third one is knowledge. Now, the algorithms actually, and perhaps surprisingly, are the least problematic. So algorithms for, for this kind of type of searching have been around for a long time. They're fit for purpose. They can be taken off the shelf. What is much more problematic um, is the data. Um, and um, the problem is encapsulated in this um, uh, article title from um, the Harvard Business Review. Um, which, is, which says simply that if your data is bad, your machine learning or your narrow AI um, uh, tools are useless. Um, and bad data is data that is, um, is not tagged, is, is unstructured in various different formats. Um, and that's significant. If you rely on um, Google Alerts, for example, um, to keep you up to date, that's very much focused on, on scraping the web um, and therefore the results that you get are, are likely to be unreliable. Much more reliable is um, uh, proprietary databases uh, like ours, for example, FSTA, um, Factiva for, for news and the various patent office um, uh, databases as well. So that's the second component. The third component is, is knowledge. Um, and this, this is really fundamental. So um, any food, um, science, technology, nutrition, um, AI powered um, service needs to be developed with subject matter expertise. So the service needs to have um, access to a subject specific vocabulary like the one that we produce. Um, and the service um, needs to be trained um, by food, um, food science experts for it, for it to be effective. So to finish off, um, I have just uh, three, um, three basic observations. So if this is an area you're interested in, um, some things to bear in mind. Firstly, um, web search and alerts um, produce unreliable results. And, and there are real life um, negative consequences of, of relying on them. Um, Currently, um, artificial intelligence is not going to deliver that single right answer. Um, however, AI-powered applications um, can deliver more relevant and insightful search results. And I, I've given you some examples of those today. Um, the third consideration is um, it's important to ask whether or not those services have been developed with input from food um, and nutrition experts um, because if they haven't, they're not going to work very well. So that concludes my, uh, my talk. So thank you very much for listening. Now, we do have some time left for uh, questions. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand and I'll get up. Oh, here we go. Really simple, unchallenging questions, ideally, please. Uh, that's the question in my mind when I was hearing that uh, AI is uh, aimed to um, deliver the single Single right, single answer. right yeah. answer, yeah, yeah, but I also need to be trained by by the professions. But um, 
During like a scientific development, a lot of time science is relatively right at this present time, and、um, like we're digging in when the AI offers the currently right answer, and we like dive into it. There might be question to be, there might be point to be questioned and challenged, and the and the science will be like feel. Fulfilled much better, but in this kind, in in this kind of、uh, situation, is AI、um, is it a downfall of AI? I don't know. So I think I I think you're saying that there are there may be some cir circumstances in which you you don't want a single right answer. Is that is that right? I I can't. Sorry, I can't hear. I think this time is like. I doubt whether this single answer is correct or not. How can we prove well, that? Well, so yeah,、or、so, so that it, so it becomes a question of trust, doesn't it? So it is do do you trust the、um, the the service that you're using to deliver?、Um, and and a, an important component of that trust is knowing that the the service has been developed by、um, food science experts, for example. But we cannot like. Doing science, we cannot build on trust because this author writes this paper. I always trust what 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 paper he writes, but it's based on truth.、So、how can we dig into dive into the truth? Because sometimes truth cannot be unveiled until more challenges are bring are brought. Yeah, so I I think there are there are different scenarios, and so you you could opt in some scenarios for that single right answer if if you felt that you could trust the the service. There may be other situations in which you're doing research and、um, and you want a, a a list of search results.、Um, what what AI can deliver is、um, some assurance about the relevance of those search results, and that that's a significant step forward, I think, when when often. You're confronted with with、um, unreliable results. All right, thank you.、Uh, any more questions? Do we have another? Yes. Thank you. Yes, follow, following up on that,、uh, maybe you could use confidence intervals or some sort of regression analysis,、uh, probability confidence、uh, to weight the.、Uh, The amount of、uh, truthfulness, quote unquote. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's not an area I know a lot about. So it'll be interesting to talk to you about about in a bit more detail. Also, your slides are they going to be available like at the FSTA、yes. website? Yes,、okay. they are. Absolutely. Okay, very good. Thank、yeah. you. That's a simple question. <laughs>